I don't believe it was an accident that the bottles were mislabeled. I don't believe that. I don't believe any of the stories that they, that they told me. It's so true in life, I believe, that um, when we um, stop chasing illusions and go after the truth, life, life can be so wonderful. Hey everyone, I'm Hill Harper. Welcome to How It Really Happened. He was born Prince Rogers Nelson. His childhood nickname was Skipper. Over the course of his career, the world knew him as Prince, the Purple One, the artist formerly known as Prince, a symbol, and once again, Prince. His towering fame didn't just come from his musical genius, but also from the many mysteries of his personal life. And perhaps the deepest secret of all was the one that caused Prince to pass. For many of us, it's hard to comprehend how a man who had millions of fans could come to an agonizing end all alone in an elevator. Prince was a brilliant artist who created music to entertain and stimulate. And his songs that won over fans worldwide came from a profoundly personal place, his great faith. I pretty much wanted to be dependent upon uh, God. And when you get the inner calling to do something and you know it, that you're being inspired by God, and you pretty much uh, uh, know you better answer that call. On April 7th, lots of people excited in Atlanta. Prince is coming to town and he's gonna do a couple of concerts. And I think his last tour was just piano and, and microphone. But the day that the concert was supposed to happen, everyone started getting news something wasn't right. Happening now, hundreds of Prince fans are waiting to learn the new date for two concerts postponed tonight at the Fox Theater because the performer is sick with the flu. He may have thought he had the flu. He did not. Everybody, you know, had a sense of alarm. Hey, he's not a guy that canceled concerts. You know, he could perform sick as a dog and nobody would know it. I mean, sick as a dog. On that very same day, he saw a doctor named Michael Todd Schulenberg, uh, and some tests were done. And so the concerts got canceled, people disappointed. Uh, when he had to cancel the show, he wanted me to help with the press release because he just felt badly about not doing the show. He comes back and he does these powerful concerts, long concerts. Um, one of the things that made fans go wild is when he played Purple Rain. And afterwards, the crowd explodes and stands up and is clapping and cheering, and they're touched by it, you know, genuinely touched by it. After those two amazing concerts, Prince tweets a quote from a fan saying, I am transformed. He told fans at the Atlanta concert, his final show, that stay tuned in a few days, you're gonna see something that's gonna happen. He gets on his plane that next day, and then everything starts to tumble. The plane makes an emergency landing. Chicago Joe, 3990 is level 18. 3990 Chicago, this is an aircraft inbound. It's going to be a medical for an unresponsive passenger. Where there was a forced landing, allegedly because he lost consciousness. We're requesting an ambulance to meet an officer at gate one. Something is not right. So when I heard about that, I just got a, a really sinking feeling, you know, because that just, you know, didn't make sense to me. When Prince's plane had to land, I knew about it before the, the press did. And it was scary, scary moment. You can hear the pilot in the plane talking to the control tower. And 990 was a male or female? I'm sorry, I missed it. A male passenger. He is given, according to our sources, he is given a medication to revive him. The 
fact that he got a Narcan shot when the first responders got there means he was not awake. He was unconscious. The fact that he woke up from the Narcan shot tells me he was unconscious because of opiates. The ambulance comes, takes him to the hospital. He leaves, and to what our sources say, he leaves prematurely from the hospital. Once he's sort of up and at him, he leaves. That's not a doctor's decision. A physician would not allow that to happen. That is a patient leaving against medical advice, for sure. Prince's reps tell TMZ he's been battling the flu for several weeks and felt considerably worse after performing in Atlanta last night. He was treated and released three hours after landing and is now back home. That, that was not the flu. You don't land a plane because of the flu. He died on the plane, and they brought him back. Somebody's going to have to tell me the real story. They're going to have to tell me exactly why you did not. When you found him on the plane, stay with him all night long and have a doctor there when he got off that plane. When Prince would talk about his childhood, he would do it in a campy way off. But you could see underneath there you know, there was some real pain. His private jet makes an unexpected detour, an emergency landing in Moline, Illinois, rushed to the hospital. But Prince doesn't stay long. So he goes back home. And here's where things get really sort of odd, and I think a lot of us are scratching our heads. He's seen that next day riding his bicycle in the neighborhood. And someone takes some video of it. I looked outside and saw a gentleman riding a bike and noticed right away that it was Prince. I was actually shocked to see him riding his bike after learning that just the day before, you know, his plane had landed and he wasn't doing well. The emergency landing, the hospital stay, it was all sort of shrouded in mystery. But it's not that surprising because everyone knew to Prince to be a very private person. He didn't like a lot of his life to be revealed. And in fact, he had said at one time that he just wanted his music to speak for him. I kind of did what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted my music as even now to speak loudest for me. We've seen some great artists in the last hundred years. I don't think anybody in the pop genre or funk or R&B holds a candle to Prince. He took it to a completely different level, set a completely different bar. I don't think there's, there's any doubt about when Prince is at his best. It's that moment from the work beginning on 1999 to the end of the Purple Rain tour. That's when he's at his peak. He, every time he turns around, he's making a hit record. I saw Purple Rain 17 times. I was absolutely mesmerized by him. Mesmerized. When did you decide music would be a career? Well, I, I learned early on this was what I wanted to do, maybe about 12 years old. I knew that this is what I'd want to do the rest of my life. Yeah. Prince is born into a, a musical family as his father had a jazz group, the Prince Rogers Trio. So. Literally, Prince is born with the name of his father's musical ambition. His mother was a jazz singer. I don't know how you could not be musical with that kind of a family. When, when Prince would talk about his childhood, he would do it in a campy way off. And, you know, he would sort of, you know, make a lot of jokes and that kind of stuff. But you could see underneath there, you know, there was some real pain. Larry King did this interview with Prince where he starts asking him a little bit about his relationship with his with his father. And he says something like, mm, you had a difficult relationship or, or a rough childhood. You, you had a rough time with parents. I mean, that's all resolved now, but your father, you had a rough time with your father, right? I wouldn't call it rough. I mean, he was uh, 
uh, very strict disciplinarian, but uh, all fathers were. Uh, I learned the difference between right and wrong. Prince says, well, I, I wouldn't call it rough, but in the nuance, you can hear the difficulties. Prince wrote a song called Papa, and he needed to write that song. It was therapeutic for him. In that song, you get a glimpse. He says, don't abuse children or they'll turn out like me. Don't abuse children or else they turn out like me. You can only assume he's talking about his own life. That's what musicians, that's what actors, that's what they do. They talk about their own life in their music. That's why Prince was so passionate about children's rights, and uh, he was a big advocate for um, protecting children. When his parents split up, Prince! his dad left behind a piano. And that seems to be when Prince gravitated towards music in earnest and began learning or teaching himself how to play. Prince learns the guitar, blows me away. Because I'm with him every day. I'm going like, where'd you learn? What, how'd you? So he said, man, it was easy. I met Prince in 1970. I believe he was around 12 years old. And I was dating his cousin. When I found out that Prince played multiple instruments, I'm going like, well, wait a minute, this guy plays guitar, keyboards, and bass? The first time I met Prince, I guess I was probably maybe 13. And I think he either asked me what I did or asked him what he did. And, uh, um, but he said he did music. And I said, so do I, you know, we should get together and jam. So he ends up living with his mom, and his dad for a little while, and when he and his dad have a fight, he goes to live with a friend of his, Andre Simone, a uh, bass player in uh, Prince's first band. He was kicked out of the house, or he moved out of the house when he was somewhere around 13. He just came and he's like, man, can I live with you guys? And I was like, you know, it was kind of late, you know, I was like, uh, I was like, it's fine with me. I said, but you, you're gonna have to talk to my mom. But he talked to my mom, and you know they had a long conversation. And you know I know my mom was like, "Well, I'm gonna have to let your mom know because I can't just you know." And so my mom talked to his mom. They worked it out. I think that Prince felt he was abandoned by his mother. You know, from my experience, from when he came to live with us, you know, um, you know, we had so much fun growing that if there was a sense of abandonment, I never recognized it because we were too busy doing the things that, you know, teenage kids do. I think he wound up living with us like six, seven years. Prince would use you till you use you up, baby. <laughs> but that's how he had become, though. Over the weekend, at, at an event called Paisley Park After Dark, Prince just up and showed up. It was a very intimate setting, and the fans said something like, Prince said, save your prayers at least for a few days for me. What does he mean by save your prayers for a few days? Doesn't that bother anybody? I think that's a typically cryptic Prince remark and says things that you have no idea what they mean. He may have no idea what they mean, but he, he was just sort of implying that was his way of saying, hey, I'm OK. I'm alive and well, I think. As I uh, go through this journey, I don't look back much at all. I try to stay in the now and live in the now. Uh, I think it keeps you young. In junior high, Prince decides to form this band, along with a couple of others, his best friend, his cousin, and his best friend's sister. So his best friend's sister, Linda, Chaz, his cousin, and Andre, his best friend. They named the band Grand Central. We played anywhere. If somebody's getting married, they're having a reception, you know, let's get to, you know, get the band. Oh, we're having a book club meeting, let's get the band. Oh, we're, you know, we're, whatever the, you know, we're having a backyard barbecue, let's get the band. All they wanted to do was be on stage and play and get girls. So the battle of the band thing started coming in. We started battling other groups and entering contests. Our manager would put us in and we'd, we'd wipe everybody out. If you won, 
you get some money, but you also get, you know, some studio time. From the very first second that I heard this demo tape, I knew it was something different. It's one kid, he just turned 18, and he's playing everything and singing everything and writing everything. I heard it and seen it with my own eyes. He was built for this. He was built to be a star. How did you get famous? Uh, it started with a lot of appearances I was doing uh, in and about Minneapolis, and uh, word just spread about- So you were a local man? Yeah, what I could do. And then uh, um, I was taken out to Los Angeles by uh, uh, my first manager, whose name escapes me. Owen Husney, I guess from what they tell me, <laughs> I was the guy who sort of discovered Prince and uh, got him his first deal and was his first manager. When Owen came in, obviously he signed Prince and got him a record deal and did all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, but Owen was so much more than a manager. You know, he was a person with a wealth of knowledge. Owen Husney called me and said, I would love for you to do pictures for this amazing new talent to get him uh, a record deal, to get him signed. I knew I wanted to be at Warner Brothers with Prince. We wound up with the largest new artist signing in the history up until that point. We looked at this as our one shot. The whole idea was at this point, was for him to do it himself, you know, um, and to record it himself. And obviously I was there and, you know, it was he was billed as sort of the one man band kind of thing. He really hadn't had his persona formed. He was just real. He was so open. He was just Prince. This was a man who knew what he wanted at a very early age, and he had the gift to be able to get it done. He had that extra something else, and that was that desire, and he was not going to fail. He was not going to fail, no matter what. The story of For You, the first record, is that Warner Brothers has signed him to uh, a guaranteed three-album deal. It's actually a good record. Prince's second album is self-titled. Uh, he's playing the instruments again. By the time we get to, to Dirty Mind, album number three, he is making songs overnight sometimes. That's the thing that lets the record company and the world know that this guy is in it to win it. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Prince. I remember we were doing the gig, the, the American Bandstand gig, and we were really excited. Yeah, you know, American Bandstand is not the first time that Prince trots out his difficult with the interviewer bit. How many years ago did you, did you make these demos and then uh, have offers on them? I just think Prince was nervous. And so when Dick was asking him those questions, you know, he wasn't sure what to say. Did somebody tell me you played every instrument on this album? Is that correct? Maybe. Yeah, no, that's it. You're very shy. So, you know, depending on who you ask, it was either a put on or he was genuinely nervous. There's this shy, quiet side that wants to disappear. So you have these two distinctly different personalities and they are fascinating and that's what draws you in. As Prince grows, and this happens with a lot of different performers, as he grows and changes, um, some of the people that surrounded him uh, at the very beginning and sort of who grew with him to a point, all of a sudden he sort of cut him off, if you will. You know, I think for the most part, when I left, it was amicable. It was very much amicable. You know, there was issues of songs because I wanted, there were songs that I had written that, you know, I had recorded in his studio that I wanted to use as a demo. He wouldn't allow me to do that. So that was not cool from my, from my perspective. Um, but, you know, I wasn't mad at him, you know. Okay, I was a little mad. So I'm, I'm backstage and I see Prince's back towards me. He goes all the way around, comes right by me, right where the stand is. And I say, yo, man, what's up? And he goes, hi and he keeps walking. I went like, what? 
Then the bodyguard comes up to me and says, you got to go. And then I just said, wow, you know, it kind of hurt me a little bit. For whatever reason, we sort of split apart. Prince wrote me a letter at one point, and he said, I love you and I love your person. Um, maybe I'm giving you a lot of demands. Prince will use you till you use you up, baby. <laughs> but that's how he had become, though. You know what I'm saying? It's the nature of this business. And unless you have somebody around you to keep you grounded, that's what happens. Prince's half-brother, Dwayne Nelson, says to uh, his attorney, Michael B. Patton, um, you know, Prince was taking Percocet. Welcome back to How It Really Happened. Prince is a legend who created all his own music and on many songs played every instrument. He became music royalty, one of the best-selling artists of all time, with over 100 million records sold worldwide, seven Grammy Awards, a Golden Globe, an Academy Award for the movie Purple Rain for best original score, and in his first year of eligibility, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That kind of purple power will no doubt stand the test of time. I've been cool enough to stay mm -hmm. close to people that uh, know the streets. You know, I live, I've always lived far away from everything. Minneapolis is, well, you know, it's <laughs> Fargo. In one of Prince's last tweets, he sends out this message to give thanks for the good weather and for all the love and support. So here's this guy who's obviously going through so much in his life, but he's got such a good relationship um, with his fans. And that goes back to well before Purple Rain. The Purple Rain concept, autobiographical? Uh, semi. Yeah, um, Albert Magnoli wrote that, uh, the script for that. Um, my whole thing was to, um, I really wanted to chronicle the life I was living at the time, which was uh, in a uh, area that had a lot of great talent and um, a lot of rival rivalries. Purple Rain is a movie made on Prince's terms. He not only comes up with the score, he not only comes up with the music, he comes up with the idea and where to shoot it. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Not exactly Hollywood. Come on, let's go. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, the movie Purple Rain was, it was like a fairy tale, like a funk fairy tale. And it was, it really lifted you up. You'd see it and you'd come out of the theater feeling just a little bit different. You're talking about this guy who makes this music of unification. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. Dearly beloved. We are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. I don't know how many people I married that summer, but there were a lot of us. And we got through this thing called life. He was extremely quiet behind the scenes. But when those lights came up, nobody did it better than him. Let's face it, if you look at the moves he did on stage in the first 10 years of his career, I mean, you had to be a refined athlete to do something like that every night. If you look at some of the videos from Sign of the Times or from Love Sexy, or, I mean, that was pretty physical stuff he was doing. Jumping off the stacks, doing the spins, and the end of the splits three or four times. There are those uh, who say that his injuries go back to 1985, to the Purple Rain Tour. Uh, he was rumored to have a hip issue and maybe a hip replacement. Uh, he walked with a cane. We all saw that. Prince performed at a very, very, very high level. And I think he sustained, you know, some injuries. And I think for those injuries, he had to take medication. I didn't see the pain and I didn't see the drugs. 
we know from talking to an attorney for one of Prince's half-brothers. Dwayne Nelson was Prince's half-brother. He is now deceased. Uh, he died many years ago. But Dwayne imparted some information to his attorney long after him and Prince had a falling out. They basically grew up together, and throughout their young life, Dwayne was someone who protected Prince. When Prince became a music star, he was on the payroll, and he was Prince's number one bodyguard. Dwayne Nelson says to uh, his attorney, Michael B. Patton, you know, Prince was taking Percocet. One of his main duties when he was Prince's bodyguard was to procure Percocet for Prince. Another of his siblings, Lorna Nelson, also gave similar information, saying that yes, indeed, Prince had taken some illicit uh, drugs. It became such a significant issue that Lorna, who also was estranged from Prince, I want to be very clear about that, uh, but was privy to what was going on in his life in, I would say, approximately 2004, um, it was her belief that Prince was going to die. His drug use was so out of control. So you have two half-siblings who both share the same story at different times in Prince's life. Um, unfortunately, we can't talk to them because they have both died. Prince apparently had long-standing hip pain. The, the nature of the hip injury is not really clear, but it would not be appropriate, appropriate for him to take opiates on a long-term basis because it will make the pain worse and trigger a second problem, dependency or addiction. Despite those allegations from his half-siblings that there was drug use, there were also people who were very close to Prince, had known him throughout his life, and say they never saw any drug use whatsoever, and they were very shocked by it. He was so against drugs. Never did any drugs in his life, didn't drink, didn't do anything. He had created a world that was unlike any other world. No drugs, none of that crazy junk. Prince was skeletal the last weeks of his life. He certainly was unhealthy. People around him should have woken up and really seen the writing on the wall. John, you were at the party at Paisley Park this Saturday that now has received so much attention. You also saw him, I guess, this past Tuesday at a jazz club in Minneapolis. You know, what was he doing there, and did he look all right there? Uh, he was at the Dakota Jazz Club in downtown Minneapolis. He was seeing a performer by the name of Liz Wright, a folk singer. Uh, he was sitting upstairs on the balcony in his kind of private table where they pull the curtains around him. He walked out single file with all the people in his entourage, had his cane thrust sl kind of slung over his shoulder, strutting out with the usual Prince attitude. There was an image, I think, that Prince had of himself that he wanted the, the world to see, just like all of us. And there was a part of him that was a regular, flawed human. He didn't want people to see that part of him. How do you handle that aspect of the media, which has often given you trouble, the, the tabloids? I, I don't have trouble with anybody. <laughs> you don't? I'm, or, do you read them? No. Do you hear about them? Uh, very seldom. Do you think any part of a personality's private life is our business? Do you think your marriage is our business? Well, you know, I, I'm like this. Um, uh, my music is my music. That's pretty much what you come to the party for. Prince was linked to a plethora of women in his life. By all accounts, he probably slept with thousands of women. He made the woman who he was with his queen, his his shining star. It's so funny because, you know, Prince is such, you know, the ladies' man and the popular imagination. But I think what people don't understand is Prince really cared about these women. Like, sometimes embarrassingly so. Man, he was just almost embarrassingly attentive. And he would try to keep it cool, but you, it's, you, you're not cool right now. You know what I mean? You're not being cool right now. Prince ends up marrying Maite in 1996. They marry on Valentine's Day. He clearly loved her. And evidence of that is a song he wrote for her, The Most Beautiful Girl in the World. And 
And then she got pregnant. And in late 1996, they had their first child. Maite gave birth to a baby boy, and the baby was born with a rare disease, and the baby only survived a week and then died. And that was devastating to Prince and Maite, and many people say that it was something that Prince never got over. Your heart just goes out for anybody that happens to. I thought it was such a terrible thing, and that's gonna mark you. He really could not get over it. In fact, he, he didn't even acknowledge it. Like, you look at interviews with Oprah, talked about it like his son was alive. What is the status of your, your, your baby, your pregnancy? Your... Well, our, our family exists. Mm -hmm. um, we're just beginning it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we got many kids to have a long way to go. And they talked about their baby boy as if the child was alive, when in fact, the child had died. You're wondering, like, what happened, and you realize now they were in absolute time of mourning, like deep, deep sadness and mourning when they're doing that interview because their baby boy had died. And clearly they didn't want to reveal that or talk about it. And eventually, Prince and the most beautiful girl in the world ended up divorcing. You mean to tell me my 57-year-old cousin who weighed 115 pounds at his death, that, that horrified my family. We were like, wait, wait a minute. I just sat there and I, I was like, how can this be? The suspicion that something was wrong was one that he worked to dispel. He wanted to be seen in public, and he wanted people to have the idea that he was well. On Wednesday, April 20th, the day before Prince died, a doctor, a California addiction specialist named Dr. Howard Kornfeld, gets a call from Prince's representatives. And they are so desperate, they say that they want to get Prince into treatment. It was Prince's people calling him to say, we need help, and we need it now. This was an emergency intervention. They needed someone there as fast as possible. Dr. Kornfeld has a scheduling conflict, and he sends his son instead, who also worked at the clinic, Andrew Kornfeld. He sends him to Minneapolis on a red-eye flight to meet with Prince. But he goes there to try to talk to Prince and meet with Prince because they realize, the Kornfeld, the father and the son, just how urgent it is. Why would you do something special, like call for a doctor multiple states away? He is just a few miles from one of the premier treatment centers in the world. Hazleton is around the corner. It's insane that they did not just take him. So after flying all night, Andrew Kornfield gets to Paisley Park and bangs on the door. And ultimately, Andrew and a couple of the people there find Prince unresponsive in that elevator. Attention, Shannon has some rescue needed for a medical at Paisley Park. Person down, not breathing. This is CNN Breaking News. Breaking news coverage on Brooke Baldwin, a massive loss in the world of music, pop culture, art, uh, superstar, music pioneer, music legend, Prince has died at the age of 57. Prince is dead. He's gone. And we're all stunned. I just sat, stared at the computer. I, uh, I couldn't believe it. And that one sentence that said the body was identified as Prince Rogers Nelson, and I just broke down. Just sat there, I hung up the phone, and I just sat there, and I, I was like, how can this be? This makes no sense. Police have released the logs of dozens of emergency calls made from Prince's Paisley Park Studios as they work to try to piece together what happened to the singer. We're also learning powerful prescription painkillers were found on Prince's body and in his home. And now the DEA is on the case. So clearly there were secrets being kept, and they didn't want folks to know. 
We now know what killed music superstar Prince. It was an accidental opioid overdose, but there's a lot more to it than that. And in fact, this isn't the end of the understanding. It's actually just the beginning. The medical examiner's report reveals that Prince was on one of the most potent drugs on the market right now. It's called fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's been around for many, many years. It was designed to be used for, for severe pain, cancer pain, short-term pain. It is an extremely powerful opiate. What we are hearing now, though, from the Minneapolis Star Tribune sources is that there were some pills found inside of the estate at Paisley Park, and that those pills were labeled hydrocodone, and that the pills, when tested, turned out to be fentanyl. In fact, we're hearing that the pills were stamped. They were containing fentanyl, but stamped with a, a mark that suggests hydrocodone or Vicodin, suggests that was something obtained on the street. What he was taking, what he thought he was taking, where he got these drugs, that's a story that still needs to be told. I don't believe it was an accident that the bottles were mislabeled. I don't believe that. I don't believe any of the stories that they, that they told me. Who supplied these particular pills to Prince. They can't find a valid prescription. So there is a criminal side to this investigation. This no doubt was a slow escalation into dependency. He had hip pain. Then, unfortunately, these drugs actually amplify pain over time. So he would start to need it during the day. Then he would start having trouble sleeping. Then when he does have trouble sleeping, we'll add in a benzodiazepine, add in a hypnotic, and now we have a lethal combination. So he's on his own in a big empty house, in pain, looking for a way to relieve the pain, and that's what kills Prince. And, and that's just, that's not, the, that's not the way you want any story to end. How do we get here? Another pop icon, a tragedy, found dead mysteriously, but drugs into play. I think there's only one answer. It's enablers who are greedy. I always felt like people were keeping them from us, like they were keeping people away from Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, they were keeping them away. And I was warned after Michael ended up dying, I was warned the same thing was going to probably happen to Prince. Prince wasn't Prince anymore. He wasn't the guy that I knew. He. He was just too far up, too far gone, as far as in the music industry, you would say. Not as a musician, but as a star. Did I let him down? Did he need me and I wasn't there? You know, should I have jumped on a plane then? You know, should I have done this, should I have done that? You can't help but feel that way. I think all of us feel that way. There was nobody else there. There was nobody else to help him. I felt bad that I wasn't there for him. I loved him. I was there from day one. We put this beginning of this together. Obviously, after that, it was his genius, you know? But we were, you know, it's, it's really hard to talk about. It's hard to lose a best friend, but I think to celebrate his spirit and I guess you know his you know his memory is to do whatever you can to keep his music alive when he died nobody on five continents said Prince who everybody knows who how does one kid own the word Prince and the color purple but he did it everybody has a place on this earth and uh, I was trying to find out where my place was. And I, I'm i really close now, and I get closer every day. I, I love living more now than uh, I did ever. Prince's legacy is that his music will absolutely live on. He was one of the world's most famous people, a musical genius, an ultra-intelligent, sensitive man, and somebody I considered a friend. Prince's friends around the world have always wanted to hear the new music in his vault. A strong box at Paisley Park where Prince stored all the music he never made public. But Prince did give up some hints or secrets. He said inside the vault 
We'll find some amazing jazz, the best, headiest tracks that his band, The Revolution, ever recorded, the more psychedelic rock version of his art, the really erotic prince, and finally he said, and I quote, we'll find the future. Thanks for watching, everybody. Here's to Prince. Good night. Somebody's gonna have to tell me the real story. They're gonna have to tell me exactly why you did not, when you found him on the plane, stay with him all night long and have a doctor there when he got off that plane.